In this video today, I want to kind of go over a little bit more in detail how a hormone can work. And the hopes of this is you can take this general idea, this, these general mechanisms, and extrapolate it or apply it to different hormones and try to figure out their possible mechanisms. I just want an overview of how things can work. So a lot of hormones, what they do is they want to uh, help create a state of stability. And we call this homeostasis. So what I'm going to do today is go over homeostasis of blood calcium. So this is the idea that, uh, I should do this right, spill this right. We want to keep the concentration of calcium constant within the blood. And I'm going to refer to this with these square brackets. And I'm going to do calcium elemental sign here and use blood. So you know that what I'm referring to here is blood calcium. And, and the point is we want to keep this constant. But we do know what we're going to see are periodically over time fluctuations in this. And our body has to adapt to those fluctuations. And what we're going to do is we're mostly going to release a hormone that we call P, P T H. This is known as para thyroid hormone. This is a hormone that is by its name obviously released from the parathyroid gland. Okay, so what we see, uh, what's important to understand is the main purpose of parathyroid hormone is to increase, that's what I'm doing with the arrow here, the concentration of the calcium in the blood. So if the parathyroid hormone releases PTH here, it ultimately should lead to an increase in blood calcium. And so when that level uh, gets to where it needs to be, we will shut off the parathyroid hormone. So we call this a negative feedback system. So the idea here is what we should see generally is if we have a decrease in the concentration of blood calcium, like what we have here, I'm just going to put a B there, then what you're going to see, and a plus here, is we're going to cause the parathyroid hormone to increase PTH secretion. Upon PTH uh, secretion, this should ultimately lead to an increase in blood calcium which then will ultimately turn this off. So we see what we call a negative feedback. Uh, body detects a decrease in blood calcium. It responds by increasing the secretion of parathyroid hormone from the parathyroid gland. This in turn over time increases the concentration of calcium in the blood, hopefully to a normal level, at which point it will feed back and turn off the release of parathyroid hormone. So this is what we call a demonstration of a negative feedback loop. So we'll see that a lot. So negative feedback loop. OK, so if we go back to here, this is kind of neat. It's good to understand this. But I like to know kind of the nitty gritty of it. I want to know what's really happening in these cases. So let's look at this and go into a little bit more detail. So what we really have is, in the parathyroid gland, receptors for calcium. So it's the parathyroid itself that will detect levels of calcium. So we're going to call these receptors for calcium, and they're actually called calcium sensing receptors, CSR. And, and this makes sense since it's the parathyroid that will release parathyroid in response, parathyroid hormone in response to a low level of calcium. So what happens is when we get a low level of calcium in the blood, we need to release parathyroid hormone. And if we look at this in the cell membrane of the parathyroid, so what we're looking at is the parathyroid glands here. We're going to have our receptors. We know how important those are. So I'm going to draw that here. And there's probably a bunch of them, right? These are sensing calcium. And when we don't have 
a lot of calcium in in the blood, they cannot bind to the receptors. So what this means is we kind of sitting in this cell here, this parathyroid hormone cell, we've got PTH sitting. And so what this is probably constantly doing is fusing with the membrane and then releasing PTH hormone into the blood. All right, so this is cool. But then once calcium returns to a normal level, we now can bind, so calcium will bind here, and it will bind here, and then what we'll see in return is an event that will eventually lead to this fusion event not occurring. So then what we're going to do is remove our parathyroid hormone that's in the blood, and that's going to stop, uh, or it will stop releasing calcium ultimately into the blood. So we don't have a further huge increase. All right, so once again, we're going to have receptors for calcium. When there isn't enough calcium to bind to receptors, we're going to have parathyroid hormone released or secreted through exocytosis into the blood. All right, and then what's interesting then is what happens after the fact. So if you think, of where can we get calcium? Where does it come from? There's really kind of three places. One of them, they can come from our diet. This is going to impact uh, the digestive system. So at some level, we're going to see how we impact the digestive system. Interestingly enough, we're going to impact the bones. Bones are great storage for calcium. So we can break down our bone if we need to release calcium. Likewise, our kidneys are going to play a role. So if we have too much calcium in our blood, then our kidneys will just excrete it. And what we can do is we can get rid of calcium in our urine. All right, this is nice. So if we have too much calcium, we just get rid of more of it. But also the other side of that story is if our calcium in the kidneys get low, we reabsorb it. And what I mean by that is we're going to bring it back into the blood. So we can bring back into the blood. So we got three kind of systems we can perturb or three kind of systems we can deal with. If our calcium's too low or if it's too high, we can alter the digestive system. If it's too high or too low, we can affect the bones. And we can also change the amount of calcium that we get rid of in our urine. Okay, so let's see how we do that. So let's think about this. Let's look at the bones first. Uh, the bones are kind of important because, well, they store most of our calcium. So if we degrade bone, we will release calcium. So if you can kind of see here, that's probably what we want to do. So if we have a low level, what we want to start to do is break down our bone. That, in turn, will release calcium back into the blood. Uh, if, we want, if we have too much calcium, we can also build bone. So we can, in a way, force calcium to be out of the blood and can build the bone. And this will use calcium. And, and that is going to pull it out of the blood. Well, interestingly enough, there are particular cells that do this. So the ones that degrade bone are what we call osteoclasts. And the ones that build bone are called osteoblasts. Okay, so this is neat. So pretty much these two are working all the time can kind of think that these aren't either on or off. They're kind of working and probably at the same level. So what happens in the case here is if we have PTH, what PTH will ultimately do is lead to greater osteoclast activity. Right, and this makes sense because we know PTH, its ultimate goal is to raise blood calcium. So that makes sense that we want to break down the bone. So one of the things at the level of the bone, PTH will bind to receptors and ultimately lead to an inequality of osteoclast activity. 
if we think of this as normal osteoblast here, what PTH is going to do is lead to an inequality here. And what we have ultimately will be more osteoclast activity, and that will lead to it breaking down and releasing calcium. So that's what we can do with the bones. You know, and then likewise, if we start to pull away parathyroid hormone, so we don't release it anymore, uh, we may lead to equality, but some other functionality may lead to the osteoblast activity increasing, and therefore we can pull the calcium out. So the bones are a great way of looking how things work. So let's look at another system here, and let's look at the digestive system just so we can get a handle on uh, what is occurring here. So in the digestive system, what we're going to see is if we need calcium, we need to absorb from the small intestines. Because that's where most of our food and our materials being absorbed or broken down is the small intestines. So in the digestive system, that's what we're referring to here, uh, we can pull it through. So what PTH does is actually it doesn't necessarily act directly. So if we look at direct response, it doesn't do it. What PTH is actually going to do is act indirectly. So it's going to act on the kidneys where it causes the creation of an active form of vitamin D. We hear a lot about vitamin D. We know that we have it in our milk, and maybe we have it there for a reason. So the idea here is the PTH hormone causes the kidneys to cause a catabolic reaction that creates an active form of vitamin D. What that will ultimately do is the vitamin D will go to the small intestines. It in turn, and interestingly, vitamin D is lipid soluble, so we've seen this kind of before, goes into the small intestines and causes an increase in the numbers of calcium transporters. Uh, calcium itself can't go through the membrane, so if we draw a lipid bilayer, because of the charged nature of the calcium ion here, uh, it, the, the hydrophobic inside, doesn't, it doesn't like it. So calcium isn't going to get through. So we have to do facilitated diffusion, if you remember. We've got to put channels or transporters here so the calcium can actually move into the cell. So ultimately what's happening at the level of the digestive system is PTH indirectly is acting on it by going to the kidney causing the kidney to create an active form of vitamin D, I believe it's called calcitriol, that will then be uh, released into the blood where it can go into the small intestines. This ultimately will cause a series of events, or basically since it's lipid soluble, it will go into the nucleus and cause an increase in the transcription and translation of calcium transporters, and this in turn, because those are being put into the membrane of the small intestine, increase calcium absorption. So hopefully you think that's as cool as I am. So we can perturb the digestive system and increase the amount of calcium it brings in. Of course, you've got to have calcium in your diet, but it's really kind of a cool system. But then if we look at the kidneys, uh, we can look at this again too. So in the kidneys, we saw its role with vitamin D. But we can also increase or decrease calcium excretion. And when I say excrete, then that means we're actually getting it out of their body. So this is going to be found in the urine. All right, so with PTH, if you think about this, the goal of PTH is to increase blood calcium. So we want to do this. We want to decrease the amount of calcium excreted. 
And so what PTH will do at one level, we know it'll do vitamin D, but it will increase calcium re absorption. Now that's kind of a weird term, and if you're not that familiar with the kidneys, uh, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense because you're, what do you mean reabsorb? Well, remember what happens in the kidneys, and most of us do know this, is blood plasma is essentially filtered. So at some point, most of the plasma of a lot of the blood as it courses through blood plasma filters, as it courses through the kidney, the plasma gets moved into these kidney uh, functional units, and, and we call these nephrons. And so then it's up to the body to decide whether it needs to bring stuff back in. So at this point, what we're saying is we put all the plasma into the kidney, and what it's going to do is decide whether it wants to reabsorb, and that means bring back into the blood, or just excrete it. So that's what we're referring to here. So in the case of PTA, it's telling the kidneys to bring that calcium that just got filtered out back into the blood because we need to get more calcium into the blood. And so that's how we can deal with the kidney. So we essentially have a system where the kidney is going to be communicated to with PTH. It will cause the increase of calcium reabsorption. This is most likely due to an increase in either the number of transporters we'll find in this nephron right here, or it may cause them to function better. Okay, so let's go back and kind of look at what we've done here. So the parathyroid hormone, because it's got receptors in a bunch of these different tissues, we can change the digestive system once again. And this is going to be uh, specifically through the act of uh, the communication with vitamin D. The bones, we're going to increase osteoclast activity because we're going to break down the bone. And the kidneys are eventually going to reabsorb calcium back in to raise it. Once the calcium returns back to its normal level, we will turn the whole system off and everybody will be happy. So hopefully that's a good explanation on kind of how these certain events can occur and you can extrapolate it hopefully to other types of hormones to kind of predict what they're going to do.